Hello, I am Dr. Harish Anand. Uh, welcome all of you for the five-day FTP program on <coughs> robotics and automation. This was a dream for the Department of Mechanical Engineering at EPCT to uh, host this uh, FTP program. And we know that when we have uh, participants from different organizations and also from different uh, departments of EPCT. On this occasion, I would like to take this opportunity to Welcome our Honorable Principal, Dr. Satish sir, to the desk. Sir, please. I would like to welcome Dr. Yogi sir also, the Vice Principal of the EPCT. We are fortunate that uh, we got indirectly linked to Elite Techno Group through SAE India and they are directly linked to SAE India. So we are very happy that Elite Techno Group is doing a wonderful uh, services in the, uh, in the country, the entire country. Today we have uh, Professor Arbas from Pune uh, who is uh, representing a Elite Techno Group. Sir, on behalf of EPCT and on behalf of the department on, on my personal, I welcome you for this five-day FDP program. Please have a seat on the desk. We have another colleague from ATG and LA Techno Group. And uh, I'm sorry that Umang is known to me, but uh, I do not know. Abhishek should support me. Shantan. Please have a desk. Have a seat on the desk, please. There is a beautiful connect to this one, and we have uh, uh, Abhishek, who is directly representing ETG from Bangalore division, and he's also with us. I would like to request Abhishek also to join me on this occasion, please. Once again, I welcome all the delegates from EPCET as well as uh, outside EPCET. There are a few more to join us in few minutes time. And this, of course, is uh, online streaming is also there. I would like to thank uh, Dhananjay Kumar who helped us to make it happen. And Dinesh is uh, continuing with it. Uh, it's over to Dinesh for a formal uh, welcome. Okay, uh, we consider this itself as a formal. I request uh, Dr. Bharat to uh, have an inno on this occasion. Uh, I'm not invoking the gods here to bless us uh, in this uh, journey of policy. Om Ganaam Tva Ganapati Mahava Mahe Karim Karinam Osha Astam Jeshtarajam Brahmana Brahmana Spatana Summan Nauti Vissi Dasadhanam Sri Mahagana Patae Namaha Navarisha Nindruk Hayagri Vaga Lord for to bless us throughout this FTP Om Hayagri Vayagri Vayagri Vaiti Vajanam Naram Vichanti Papa Narendra Vivasdaha Sri Guru Bhyama Hari Om Thank you Yeah, it uh, was our dream. In fact, I told you in the beginning itself that we have been uh, instructed as well as we also have realized that any program in the current academic year we wanted to carry it out on the robotics and automation only. And that is the trend of the day and a lot of uh, support we are getting from the management and also from the principal's office. I really thank the management as well as the principal office for the uh, great support. And on this occasion, I would like to request our principal to have a few words on this. Very good morning to everybody. And uh, respected the boss, sir, and the woman, and uh, Thank you very much uh, for traveling to this particular place, which essentially is a little far away from uh, the city 
and uh, so I think you probably Monday is also another bad day to go in Bangalore normally. Okay. So coming to that particular this, I think you know probably the robotics. If you look into that particular, it is more than uh, four decade old uh, subject as such. But the basic particular front is uh, because you know in fact a lot of particular water has flown under the bridge in the area of robotics and automation, where essentially it creates a lot of new year interest in this particular subject is looking at the industry 4.0 and what essentially we can do it in deep learning particular this. If you look at any of the particular this, for example, I don't know whether you have heard of the iRobo or the, the vacuum cleaner particular thing or any of the particular this, that is where deep learning comes into picture. So most of the particular this today, whatever the basic thing probably for at all, I think many of you are quite young and you might not have seen any of the English movies that came in the late 70s or the early 80s particular days or you have read any of those books as such. If you look into that particular front, a lot of futuristic uh, aerobic that uh, was already dreamed of that particular place. So today we are in relatively a better position to look into that. Because major particular thing is that you, know, you need to look at it is not about uh, just the robotic control particular this where essentially the precision control happens. How essentially we look at the precision control of that? What are the types of the control that we should be able to look into that particular? That itself is a good particular subject area as such. Now today we are relatively moving beyond this particular this with the industry 4.0 called digital twins particular this. That is where industry 4.0 becomes much more you know, popular particular this and it much more challenging particular this. So digital twin is a very, very good concept. If you have looked at the, you know, the Gartner or Hypercar or any of the particular this, in fact, that tool doesn't top to two of the set, top three particular technologies in the 2025, 2022 report is what essentially the thing that I'm referring to. Okay. So the lock, these particular subjects, when you look into that particular, you need to be able to have a basic, the, a deeper understanding of both the electronics and the mechanical particular. So that is where essentially it, it is more of an inter, interdisciplinary field rather than one particular field as such. So you need to look into that particular and then be able to say how essentially you are able to manage those particular things. Today, one particular thing that essentially has happened is that you, know, you don't need to look at a lot of uh, the mathematical equations and then do those particular things as such because most of those particular things have already been taken as a framework particular this and then we do have the relatively better libraries particular this to take care of those particular this. So most of the problems that we had in the early 1980s and the 90s particular this have been addressed to that greater extent. That is the reason why our challenges, the way in which we are accepting meetings are telling about the engineers better problems, better particular this is because of the way the electronics has improved the whole particular thing. At the moment electronics improves, then every other particular thing becomes very, very easy for us. So that is how essentially, you know, today the robotics and automation has been of a very, very important subject for all the particular this gone much beyond the various the, the way which essentially we were using it only in the OD particular this. Today if you look into that probably you know, the one of the major particular areas in which essentially we are, you know, the DOD, the DOD means I am perfectly counter defense of US standards or any of those particular things. So the way in which we are looking at that is probably how essentially the next war will be, you know, fought like that. So whether it will be, you know, whether any human being will be involved in that particular this or not. So there are a lot of things that essentially are there because that is where we are, you know, thinking of sport of erotics and automation particular. And that is where we are we'll looking at, you know, more of the EHG level, you know, decision making as such. Today, if you look at the EHG level, the EHG levels are essentially, you know, they, they will only be able to see and then they will be able to particular this, but they will not be able to think. So those particular things are also looking into that particular That is the reason why if you are looking at that particular recently, you know, Intel made an investment of more than 65 billion dollars in this particular field. So this field is becoming very, very interesting as you go along because there is a lot of the expectations from this particular, you know, from this particular field as such. So we have already seen that you know, these particular technologies are just not in the high end particular this, but they are not, they are just coming to the home also. Okay. So that is the reason why 
things are becoming very very important for us to understand this particular this but i do not know how many of you are really well versed in control systems and other control fact how well since you are able to look at those particular fact but today if you look into that most of those particular things are being addressed with uh, the various framework as i said particularly the deep learning frameworks are become very very popular in this particular this so i do not know the content of uh, the next by exactly the various particular this by this that essentially we will look into that particular fact so have a look is looking to that particular fact this is an exciting uh, field as such uh, for both uh, the electronics and the mechanical people so we have a wonderful uh, you know and a productive period for the next 3 uh, 4 months okay so thank you very much and uh, i wish you all a beautiful uh, lunch thank you sir yeah uh, we try to cope up to the uh, knowledge and the <coughs> facts of uh, the tower of principles and we know we have already realized that we will definitely start running to remain where we are today uh, having said this and uh, i would request uh, our boss to have a few words before this and after this direct delivery will be there for about 1 hour and then afterwards there will be a it break and then the session continues till the lunch break so it's out of us hello good morning everybody super so it's a really honor to me on my mind to be here with all of you all of you and i thank uh, east point college management to all the faculty and everybody who is working online for a warm welcome and uh, i would like to tell you that when we approach east point college we were actually you know interested in student development programs but when the management requested for a faculty development program i personally saw it as a opportunity and i think it's a, it's a great initiative because you know as a company or as a as a person teacher i can only reach to so many students it's going to be 100 or 1000 but if i reach to faculty right that number multiplies exponentially and that should be our goal like that's that's the thing i think you know matters the most reaching out to the students with more number and uh, with that i like to keep my uh, speech short so thank you everybody from the bottom of thank you abbas uh, the program is like this the itinerary the first two days uh, the complete resource persons we have requested from edg only and they have been kind enough in fact Uh, magnanimous in their uh, uh, approach, and they were doing as the uh, Abbas just now said. They were approaching towards the student development program, and that on our request, definitely they have agreed with full heart. And we are really thankful to EDG uh, the entire group, sir. Thank you so much. And the third day, we have uh, expertise from the UK and India training center itself. Usually, they charge about one lakh rupee for one. Uh, Training program on hydraulics and pneumatics and other things. So hydraulics and the other related components that the UK and India manufactures and the first set of uh, expertise are going to be here. I think it is going to be the number may be small, but still it's going to be a very wonderful hands-on experience as well as a great learning is going to happen. And later part we are visiting to a high-speed automation and uh, robotics industries. the 24th as well as on 25th two days we have a uh, outing that is industry visit only high speed automation industry only i am repeating i am stressing on the subject so this is uh, what is uh, the the brief uh, idea about our fdp program for five days and now uh, i request uh, our boss to take over uh, the dais for the first session delivery before which let me uh, read out the brief uh, by the way of uh, arbas mr arbas sheik senior research associate ali techno groups uh, his expertise is in the automotive engineering cat solid works catia crew etc and cae cfd ansys hypermesh gdnt as a student counselor he has uh, trained more than 10000 plus students technically and also consulting and he has inspected and tutored teams to create 100 plus atvs that's wonderful sir uh, very nice to read out on this and student formula cars electric vehicles for racing competitions 
we are in the same line, sir. Uh, we we hope that we get benefited on that. And here, the, the as per the work experience is concerned, research associate from 2020 until present, Allied Techno Groups India, and he is uh, creating contents for the industrial courses made under the banner of Allied Techno Groups and conducting interactive technical webinars, researching the latest trends in the industry, maintaining relations with the industry experts working with EDG. So we are one among that. Thank you uh, for this. And he is also a design consultant for the Mercedes Benz and Kiloskar Pumps India. And a lot of uh, CAE and CFD design analysts uh, also he is involved. And A2 Innovative Research and Training Pune India. He is also responsible for undertaking and leading ventures uh, in the domains of C and D for films specializing in varied sectors. Accountable for managing multiple teams, projects, and training sessions for interns with continual oversight. We are hoping to join you, sir, in this. Computing the scope of research or manufacturing validity for several projects on different application scales. Sir, we are very happy to have you over here on this occasion. Thank you very much, and it's over to you, sir. Thank you.
Hello once again everybody. So again I would like to thank Thay Sir for such a great introduction and such a great you know description of my profile. And uh, today we'll be starting up uh, with electric vehicles. Basically we'll be talking about electric vehicle architecture and what are the different kinds of electric vehicles. So we'll be going into hybrids, what are different kinds of hybrids, what is the future of electric vehicles and we'll have a healthy discussion. I hope to have a healthy discussion with you guys as what you think could be you know, the next step into EV, right? So like Harisha said that uh, the world is changing, like in short, if I summarize it, you were, uh, Harisha was like, the world is changing. Everything that we used to do on paper, with equations, with mathematics, everything is happening in the software, right? And it's like every, each and every part of manual work is now going to change into robotics, right? Uh, there are going to be machines, there are going to be, uh, you know, the communication between machine, which is IoT industry 4.0, which will monitor the entire floor rather than the entire factory, right? To product a certain product, to produce a certain product. So with that change, you know, we need to provide the future engineers with that knowledge that this is going to happen and this is how it will happen, right? And that is why it's the need of the hour today to, you know, educate the students regarding that, okay? So with that, let's continue with our uh, session today uh, based on electric vehicle architecture. So uh, when we talk about electric vehicle, Okay, so before I start, I'd like to, you know, have a small inter interactions with the faculties. Anybody who would like to, you know, come up and uh, give a few, uh, your understanding of what electric vehicle today is, right? So, anybody, any volunteer, if, if I could have. So. Okay. Not a problem. Anyways, so I'll give you what today electric vehicle is. Right? So we are seeing electric vehicles everywhere. If you go to, if you board a flight, there is going to be buses which are going to carry you to the flight, and those are going to be electric vehicles. The government buses, the uh, you know the bogies which travel inside the campus, those are all electric vehicles. Right? right? And we are seeing that change massively happening in the past two three years. We've seen that change happening, and as we all know, that somewhere around the line, future is going to be electric vehicle. No matter what kind of fuel we generate, we used to generate the electricity. The future is going to be electric vehicle. And I, I guess we are in the first initial steps of getting there. We have developed good lithium and batteries. We have developed good controllers. We have developed, you know, everything that could be fit inside an automotive, uh, automobile. And at the same time, is affordable for the public, right? So let's see how the architecture uh, of a vehicle works. So like I said, there is going to be two sections of this session before the high team will be finishing off with these two sections. First will be the electric vehicle architecture. And then the types of EV in the market that currently are there, right? So if I talk about electric architecture, electric vehicle architecture, there are three things that I could, you know, focus on. So first would be electric propul propulsion, then there's energy source and auxiliary system. So basically propulsion is nothing but whatever is required for an electric vehicle to go forward, okay? It could be the motor, it could be the controller of the motor. Now coming to the energy source, energy source currently is just battery. Okay. So we will be talking about how uh, the battery works and what are the you know, components that are required to take that power from the battery which is stored inside the lithium ion cell and to run a motor so that electric vehicle can go forward. Right? And lastly we have the auxiliary system which are also present in the current automotive uh, you know, vehicles and you see that you know these systems like wiper, headlamps, smart, uh, like basically if you see MG Hector in today's day, that vehicle is a smartphone in itself, right? you'll find everything in it. I am shocked at why we didn't have candy crush in it till now. So that's the kind of, you know, approach we are taking towards the vehicle. We are building our auxiliary system is so strong that it is better than a smartphone, right? It will listen to you, it will talk to you, it will take you places, everything is done inside a vehicle. And those are the auxiliary systems. So if we talk about electric propulsion first, right? So I would like to, you know, uh, give the few points that come under electric propulsion and I'll give a small description of each of them very quickly. Okay, so first of all, we have the electric motor. Now, these motors are nothing but the prime movers for the vehicle. It will push the vehicle forward uh, using the electricity, right? That's that's the basic understanding everybody has. Now, next thing is that either this vehicle could be DC, which is pressure DC motor, which is most commonly used in today's life, or it could be AC. Now, coming back to, uh, I'll come back to the AC point in a while, but next uh, comes up is the inverter. So inverter is something that controls the speed. So when you press the accelerator in a traditional vehicle, in a gasoline vehicle, what happens is the carburetor valves open up, the butterfly valve or throttle, whatever it is, it will open up and let more air in. And when 
that air comes in, more fuel comes in, and the vehicle runs faster, right? And that's the logic behind using a gasoline vehicle and pressing the accelerator during a gasoline vehicle. But when we talk about electric vehicle, there is no air. Air is not a matter of concern for electric vehicle. So what could be driving the motor faster when you press the accelerator? It's nothing but the frequency of the current that is provided. It changes the frequency, and because of that, you know the motor runs faster. Now, one characteristic about electric motor is it is supposedly gives a constant torque throughout, right? And uh, you might know this. There's a world record held by a uh, student formula team who had made an EV for fastest acceleration. Okay, it has not done by Tesla, it has not done by Ferrari, it has not done by Bugatti. It is actually done by a Supra team, uh, not a Supra team, but FSA team, a student team, who have done uh, zero to hundred. You know, kilometers per hour within, I guess, 1.92 seconds. That's the uh, that's the rough, uh, rough number I remember. And that is actually done by an electric vehicle. The main reason behind that is that electric motors can provide constant torque, and even at varied frequency, at even at various varied speeds, which is not the case in gasoline vehicle, right? If you see a uh, traditional gasoline vehicle, you find we usually have a graph which you know goes upward with the RPM like this. And during its RPM increases, the torque will decrease like this. Right? It will increase till a point and then it will decrease. But in a motor, it's more or less constant. And that's the main you know, reason behind getting that um, world record for that student community, having electric motor. Now moving on to the next part, which is which comes with the electronic controller. So electronic controller is something that connects everything. We have the accelerator, we have the motor, we have the you know inverter. Electronic controllers controls everything which is like the ECU or the you know control unit of the entire vehicle, which will sense if the pedal has been pressed, if there is uh, you know any kind of sudden power surge required, or if there is drop of sudden power and then we need to go for regenerative braking. All these things are done by electronic control system. Now, next thing that comes along with electric propulsion is DC to DC converter and DC to AC converter. Now, uh, if you see a, a typical vehicle in today's day, right, a gasoline vehicle. All the auxiliary system or all the electrical system works on 12 volt base, right? It, it does not work at 48 volt, volt base, right? But an electric vehicle comes with a 48 volt battery. It will provide current at 48 volt. Because of that, we need to convert the 48 volt to 12 volts so that we can run the other auxiliary systems similar to what we did in the gasoline vehicle. And for that, we need a DC to DC converter. It's actually, it steps down the voltage so that it can run the entire vehicle with the same battery. Apart from that, we also have DC to DC to AC converter. Like I said, I'll be coming back to the AC motor in a while. So, most of the time, most commonly used with, uh, motor is real DC motor, brushless DC motor. But in some applications, we also have AC motors. Now, the AC motor applications are tremendously higher. You can see, like uh, tremendously, actually, uh, you know, uh, you call it. It's, it has varied applications. Can be applied where you require high torque, where you require high speed. At, and it's more controllable, AC current, right? So that is why you sometimes need DC to AC converter for AC motor so that you can run the AC motor on the DC battery because battery is going to provide the stored current at direct condition. Now moving on to the energy source, right? So energy source, there are three things mainly. First one is the energy storage device or energy generation device, which could be battery, fuel cell, engine and battery in case of hybrid engine, right? The next thing comes is energy management system. So in case of hybrid vehicles, so if you see, uh, today we have uh, uh, Toyota Prius, Toyota, uh, another vehicle is, I guess, I'll come to it, I don't remember the name, but yeah, energy management system, what it does is it, it, you know, confirms where to take the energy from. Should it be taken from the engine, should it be taken from the motor, at what time which application is being used. That is done by energy management system. And next unit is charging and refueling unit in the energy source uh, package. So basically, if you have a fuel tank, that's your uh, refueling unit, right? And then for charging infrastructure, you need internal components inside your electric vehicle so that the charger can be connected and the battery can be charged. And that is what comes under the charging and the refueling unit. Next, moving on to the auxiliary systems, like I said, there are uh, multiple applications that, you know, uh, in even today's gasoline vehicle, we have auxiliary systems like wiper, power steering, headlamps, and all those things. But the main thing in EV is that you need a thermal management system because all the electrical components that work, right? They don't have a coolant system as of now. Like we don't, uh, we can't incorporate because there's no pump running with the crankshaft, right? In the gasoline vehicle, there's a crankshaft which continuously provides a rotation. 
But in electric vehicle, you cannot do that because there is no constant rotation. You are going to change the rotation of the motor with you know changing your accelerator pedal. So that does not happen. So that pumps, uh, pumps and everything won't work. So that's why we need auxiliary systems in electric vehicles so that cooling would take place, and that comes under the thermal management system. Apart from that, like I said, the vehicles are getting smarter. They have, uh, they are typically an Android phone inside a vehicle, right? And that is more likely to be an electric vehicle because at that time you have the main thing that that requires uh, that you know uh, that is required to run all these things is electricity, right? It's not going to run on gasoline. So electricity is stored already in battery, so it's pretty easy to use in electric vehicle, and it is a key for development of these kind of things, right? So like I said, MG Hector today has a lot of potential still to you know grow in that part in the, in the market of uh, you know being smart maybe. and that's for the auxiliary system now to, uh, now we'll move on to the types of electric vehicle so on the right of the screen you see the chart right uh, which determines the energy source the vehicle type and propulsion device right so let's first look at the energy source you'll see that as we move uh, down the chain right the hydrocarbon fuels the consumption of hydrocarbon fuel is reducing, right? At the same time, uh, the battery is increasing. The power used by the battery is increasing. And lastly, we have fuel cell electric vehicle in which there is no battery, there is no hydrocarbon fuel. There is just there is some amount of battery and there's hydrogen used in it, and there is no hydrocarbon fuel. So that's the you know flow of it. So let's let's uh, take one by one what these things are, right? So first of all, we have uh, internal combustion engines. Uh, in which we use completely hydrocarbon fuels. We do not use electricity for propulsion. And as you can see on the extreme right, propulsion device is combustion engine itself, right? The entire block is given to the combustion engine. Next comes is micro HEV. I'll be going into details of this. There are three different kinds of uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, micro, mild, and full. And then we go to plug-in as well. So basically, when we go to the micro uh, electric, hybrid electric vehicle, at that time, majority of propulsion or majority of uh, you know workload is taken by the hydrocarbon fuel and very small quantity if i can if you can see my shadow i don't have a laser pointer but if you can see this small corner is taken up by the battery right uh, i don't know if i can point out uh, with the cursor anyway so very small amount of battery is used in micro hybrid electric vehicle then we come to the mild hybrid electric vehicle in this case you'll see the battery percentage has increased and fuel has reduced and at the same time you can see the propulsion device is also uh, battery electric motor has been increased a little bit in the propulsion device as well and the combustion engine has reduced then we come to a full HEV which is hybrid electric vehicle the example of which is Toyota Prius in that we use both in 50 50 percent right we give the load distribution to motor and engine equal so if there's an engine that provides peak power of 20 kilowatt there's going to be a motor that provides a peak power of 20 in full hybrid electric vehicle. Then we come to the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So till now, from the chain we came down, right, till now there is no point for charging the vehicle via grid. You cannot connect a wire to your vehicle to charge the battery. Till now, the battery charging was happening to hydrocarbon fuels, right? We were doing regenerative braking, we were using generators from the crankshaft, and that is how charging of the battery was done. But with plug-in electric, uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, we have the engine which again has you know reduced its contribution and battery has increased now we can charge the battery directly from the grid it can be from the grid it can be so it can be solar it can be you know uh, any other source by which electricity can be produced then we come to range extended electric vehicle and range extended electric vehicle is sort of opposite of micro hybrid electric vehicle as you can see in that case hydrocarbon fuel is hydrocarbon fuels are very less right and the battery part takes the majority of it and which was opposite in micro hybrid electric vehicle, the most of the majority of the part was taken by the hydrocarbon fuel and very less was done by the batteries. But in range extended EV, it's opposite. We'll go into the details of each of this uh, as we proceed with the webinar. Next, we have battery electric vehicle, or we can call it full electric vehicle. In this, there is no internal combustion engine. There is zero emission. Everything is done by charging. So today we have uh, Tesla in the market. We have Tata Nexon. We have Ola Electric, we have Bajaj Chetan, all these are full electric vehicle or battery electric vehicle as you like call it. Because they don't provide, they don't you know emit any kind of gases. They they don't have internal combustion engines. Now lastly we come to the fuel cell. Now according to most research, fuel cells are 
the future, right? That's given. What uh, they do is instead of using a, a IC engine to produce the power and generate electricity and store it in the battery, they use hydrogen instead of hydrocarbon. They what they do is they put hydrogen, they put oxygen, they do some you know chemistry in it. They produce water, and when that water is produced, there are free electrons that are allowed to flow. And using those free electrons, they charge the battery, and that's the idea of fuel cell uh, EV. Now, moving on to the micro hybrid electric vehicle. So, I'll quickly go through what the functioning of micro hybrid electric vehicle is, how this thing works. Okay. So, basically, as you can see, I have drawn a circle on the right of the screen, and that's the that part is actually a motor generator. Okay. It's very small. What it does is it charges while the uh, vehicle is running and it is used to start the engine okay so we have the magnetic side which takes the battery power and then you know runs uh, starts the engine in the commercial vehicle or you know gasoline vehicle but in this case there is a separate generator which generates electricity when the uh, when the engine is moving and when we need to start the engine at that time this motor will run the engine it will, it will crack the engine basically so that you know your battery, your uh, main battery does not take uh, load of that. And because of that, what happens is we can put a smaller battery, like uh, 12 volts, uh, and with that we can run the entire auxiliary system of the car. Now this is done by uh, Sias, I guess, no, uh, Mahindra Scorpio, BMW 1 series. They have done an excellent job. What they do is, all the auxiliary systems work on engine charging. So instead of giving us uh, just a generator in it, we also put motor in it. That's the only difference. Now, as you can see, the majority of load will be taken by majority of the propulsion will be done by the engine itself, right? It is used for starting the engine. The motor and generator is very small. The motor could be of, you know, 10 kilowatt and it's powered on demand, which means when you need to start the vehicle, even in cold condition or whatever it is, in that case, it can be used to charge up the uh, uh, crank up the engine. Now, what happens is because of this, engine size can be scaled down to 5 to 10 percent. And because of that, fuel efficiency is increased by 5 to 10 percent. Now, scaling down an engine by 5 to 10 percent is a massive thing in the industry because if you scale down an engine by 5 percent, the volume of the entire uh, engine will reduce by 25 percent. The space it takes inside a vehicle will reduce by 25 percent, up to 25 percent. And because of that, reducing the scaling down the engine is a very important thing. So, adding this small component will scale down the engine by 5 percent take less space in the vehicle which means it will be lighter it will run faster and you'll be more fuel efficient apart from that like i said the battery charges from the motor and all uh, all the auxiliary systems work on the 12 volt battery that has been charged now again auxiliary systems are systems like headlight wiper and all the uh, traditional things you see in a gasoline vehicle now moving on to the mild hybrid electric vehicle the examples of which is suzuki size Mazda suzuki size uh, mazda 2 and these vehicles are uh, a step ahead from a microelectric vehicle, okay, micro hybrid electric vehicle. In this case, instead of using a 12 volt battery, we are using a 48 volt battery along with a 48 volt motor. And what the battery and the motor are used for is reducing the engine lag, okay. So, especially when you, uh, I, I don't know if you notice this, but next time you sit in a car, when you're driving a car, try to press the accelerator as hard as you can if the road is open, of course. And you'll notice that the time it takes to press the accelerator and the, the response of the engine that comes to the wheel and then you get the acceleration. That time is a long period and right? it, it produces a lag in your acceleration. So in my little hybrid electric vehicle, this extra motor is attached to the engine and this gives a extra boost to your car. Which means when you press the accelerator, it will the sensors will sense that you have you know suddenly pressed the accelerator, there is need for certain power which the engine could not provide because there is going to be some lag. To reduce that lag, we use mild uh, electric, uh, hybrid electric vehicle. The motor is used for that. Apart from that, when you are overtaking, when you are uh, when you're starting from zero, when you are on the slope, you need extra torque, right? And as I said, electric mo motors will provide higher torque at all times or a constant torque at all times. So during these conditions, right, the motor, the, there are sensors which sense if you are standing on a slope, there are gyroscopic sensors inside a vehicle, there will be uh, sensors to sense how hard you are pressing the accelerator. There will be sensors to sense how far objects are apart from the vehicle. And uh, with these sensors, the ultimate decision will be made by the ECU to provide the extra torque to the vehicle. To overtake, to climb up a hill or whatever it is. And that is why, that is how the mild uh, hybrid electric vehicle works. In this case, 
the power of the motor is up to 20 kilowatt and because of that the uh, fuel efficiency increases by 20 percent or fuel consumption reduces by 20 percent basically what happens is when you press the accelerator when you're starting or when you're you know uh, overtaking someone you press the accelerators there is a sudden surge of fuel you know you need a lot of fuel to get that initial boost and that boost is now given by the uh, motor and because of which we can say that you know that extra fuel that was needed will not be needed in, in that case and because of that you get a lot of savings in, in terms of fuel now all the auxiliary systems work on this 48 volt battery right so like i said previously we had 12 volt battery now we are using 48 volt battery so we need to have that uh, 48 volt battery power converted into 12 volt system because all of the other systems are working on 12 volts right and for that we use a dc to dc converter and that's the difference from uh, in the mild hybrid electric vehicle from the uh, micro hybrid electric vehicle. Now going to full hybrid, right? So Camry and Prius from Toyota are the examples of these, right? In this case, the motor is used for propulsion. Till now, motor was just assisting the engine to go forward, right? In micro, it was a starting. In mild, it was giving that extra torque. It was giving that extra boost. But now we are using motor to, uh, you know, get that propulsion to go forward with our vehicle. Basically, what uh, is done in this case is we, like I said, we have motor and engine at equal power. So if I go back to uh, that slide pretty quickly, yeah. As you can see, we have the uh, HEV written over here. And in that case, you can see hydrocarbon fuels and battery are providing equal amount of power. Okay. And that is where we can see that the motor and the engine will be of equal size, right? And because of this, as you can guess, the engine size and the engine requirement will reduce by 50%. And if you reduce the engine size by 50%, it takes a massive hit on the volume occupied by the engine, the mass of the engine, and therefore increases the performance, right? Now, uh, all electric power is generated by the engine and regenerative braking. So till now, there is no charging point in the vehicle, right? So what happens in Toyota, Camry and Prius, what they do is, whenever you press brake, whenever you are at a signal, whenever you know engine is running, at that time, it charges up the battery. Okay, and even when you're cruising, at that time you might hear that the engine is running faster, but you're going at a slow speed. The engine is running faster. During that time, the engine is used to charge the battery, so that you know at some point you can use motor to go forward. Now the thing with this kind of vehicle is, uh, it's very difficult for a human being to decide if we should use engine or a motor to go forward, right? As you, can, uh, as you can imagine, you're sitting inside a car, you're on a highway, and suddenly you feel like, you know, you're low on fuel. So you would not be able to take that decision, okay, I need to go to the motor, so I have to take the switch or whatever it is, right? So it's, it's very difficult for a human being to decide to go to that level. But what we can do in this case is, uh, we can incorporate the energy management system, right? Now, energy management system is something that takes the uh, input from the uh, battery side, from the fuel side, from the requirement of the uh, engine, right? If you need cruising, the battery is the best way for that. Uh, if you need overtaking, your motor will be the best way for that, right? And if there is low battery and high fuel, in that case, it will charge the battery while running on the petrol. And this is how, you know, the energy management system makes the decision of using gasoline, gasoline as a propulsion device or battery as a propulsion device. And like I said, all auxiliary systems work on primary battery. So here again, primary battery would not be of 12 volts, it might be of 48 volt, and it will go up to 100 volt, depending on vehicle. And because of that, again, we need DC to DC converter to run all the auxiliary systems. So that's the difference between micro, mild, and full hybrid vehicle. Now, next thing that we can come to is plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Right? So in this case, like I said, till now we didn't have any point to charge the battery. Okay. So the entire vehicle was running on engine itself. So engine was used to charge the battery, then the battery's power was used to run the motor, and whatever work was done by the motor was done because there was engine running in the first place. But in this kind of vehicle, you'll see there are two ports, one on the rear side of the vehicle and one on the front side of the vehicle. On the rear side, it will have a fuel tank. Okay, you'll fill up the gasoline in that, and on the front side, you'll have a battery charging unit. Right? And if you can charge the battery, you can, you know, get a longer range. You, and in that case, what happens is with this plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, all the power from the uh, in the battery is stored from the charging point, right? So you can be sure if I put in fuel in a vehicle, that fuel is only going to be used for propulsion and not for charging. And in case of battery, you need 
always you need to keep the battery always charged. Now the thing with this, the main advantage of plug-in hybrid electric vehicle is you can work on either basis. You can go for uh, the hybrid, uh, I mean you can go for electric as well and you can go for gasoline as well. So if you know, today I am going to, I have less fuel in my vehicle, so overnight you can charge the battery and use the battery to, you know, go to the fuel pump or go to the whatever work you have and then go to the fuel pump, right? But in case, let's say you are at a point where you cannot charge the battery, in that case you can use your fuel. Now, why this point comes up, why this point is very important is because we are used to gasoline, okay? If today I tell you to shift to EV, the only key difference that you are going to notice is that gasoline and battery are different in terms of power, okay? So now if you uh, think about it, transporting gasoline, consider gasoline as a unit of power, okay? If you take one liter of gasoline, it's going to have some kilowatt of, uh, uh, of power, right? Now transporting that in a can is quite easier than transporting batteries, right? For the same amount of power. If you think about it, uh, if your vehicle breaks down in the middle of the road, right? You cannot, like it's not possible till now, or it is under research till now to swap batteries. And even if we do that, it's very difficult. But your vehicle breaks down in the middle of the road, it's quite easy to fill up the fuel, right? You can fill up one, two liters, three liters, and go fill the petrol pump or the fuel pump, whatever it is, right? So basically, that's the advantage of having fuel, uh, uh, yeah, like gasoline vehicle. And that is why we are used to gasoline, because it's so easy to transport, right? If you think about it, they, let's take an extreme example, okay? We talk about rockets. Rocket fuel is extremely expensive. It's extremely, they have to calculate how much fuel they are going to use, right? And how much fuel they need to carry in the fuel they have, right? Because the mass of the uh, rocket will increase if they put in more fuel. So they have to calculate how much fuel they are going to need to travel to some distance and they'll have to uh, calculate how much fuel they'll need to whatever fuel they have in the rocket and that's called the rocket equation. Now that is very difficult. If you, if you think about it, the more fuel you add, the more fuel you need and there's going to be some saturation point, you know, it, it's a converging series at which, you know, at some point, infinite point, you're going to converge to a point where you can fill in the fuel enough to carry the fuel and to take you to the destination. But in case of gasoline, if you think about it, it's so easy, right? Even if you want to go 6 kilometers from here, you can carry the fuel to take you 300 kilometers, right? It's not going to take any extra effort. If, even if it does, it's not necessary, right? What I mean to say is, let's say if you need 1 liter of petrol from going point A to point B, at that time you can have at least 30 liter of petrol in your tank and still go 1, one kilometer without losing your efficiency. And that is what we are used to, right? And that's why gasoline is popular. So that advantage can be incorporated in plug-in electric vehicle plug-in hybrid electric vehicle along with the advantage of electricity. Now coming to the point of electricity, right? Charging up the vehicle is very, um, I would say, effortless, right? If you think about it, you can have a port at your, in your parking, in your building. You come at night, you start charging the vehicle and it, it will be ready for you in the morning. But if you have fuel uh, strike, so if you have, let's say, tomorrow morning you have to go and first fill up the fuel and then go to the work, go to work, right? You know, in life we have been in this situation where we take our vehicle, we have to first go to the fuel pump, we have to stand in line, get the fuel pump and then go to the work. And that's that's when we become late, we, we get late to work. And the reason for that is again, you know, availability of fuel and uh, it depends on where you stay, where you're going and all those things. So in that case, electric uh, electricity helps us, right? Electricity is much easier to get, you can get it at your house. So that is why plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicle has an advantage of these two. The best example of these kind of vehicle is Mitsubishi Outlander and BMW 330 ECDs. And uh, that would be it for plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Now, before going to extended range EV, I would like to know if there are any doubts from uh, any of you. If uh, a doubts or any you know, discussion we, we, uh, we could have. Till now we've talked about hybridization, till now we've talked about how we can combine the uh, you know engine with the battery and how we can start the motor. I would like to ask you guys, I would like to you know consider this as a, uh, as a as a stopping point or a pausing point where we can think with this what could be the future of EV. Right? Before we go to the next slide or uh, the next part which is extended range EV, I would like to think what could we do in this sector, in the hybrid sector to improve in EV. Right? So first thing that comes to mind, the smaller the engine the better. Right? Even if we have plug-in, we have 50-50. What if we can go to a point where the engine is smaller? Right? That's what we are all thinking. That's, that's the first thing that would come to anyone's mind. 
that even today we are a technology with plug in hybrid electric vehicle that we need 50% of engine and 50% of battery power. But imagine if you need 80% of battery power and only 20% of engine. The amount of fuel it will save, the amount of emission it will save, and the amount of space uh, that will be reduced to occupy that engine is going to be tremendous. And that's the advantage that comes with the extended range. Okay. So basically, what this model is, let me give you a quick overview of what it is, right? Basically, all the propulsion is done by the battery, battery and motor, right? It is charged using a plug-in socket. It has a fuel uh, tank as well, a smaller fuel tank and a smaller engine. The key word here is small, right? Now, the power is generated by the motor. The propulsion is used, uh, motor is used for propulsion and there is a socket available for charging as well, right? But the only key difference is, till now in plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, what we were doing is, we were getting from point A to point B, either using electricity or gasoline, right, or 50-50. But now what we'll be doing is, we'll be going to, uh, to point A to point B by using 80% of electricity. 80% of power will be coming from electricity. Now imagine if you're sitting inside a car, you have an electric vehicle and there you haven't been able to charge your vehicle up to a certain point or up to a uh, fullest point or you haven't you know filled the battery completely. Now from that point if you take your vehicle out in the uh, open or on the highway, it's very difficult for you to stop and charge your vehicle. In that case, if the battery is about to run out, in, in that case the energy management system detects that the battery is running low and the small engine that is fitted over there will start running on its own without any accelerator it might have a governor, it might have its own method of running and it will run and it will generate electricity and store it inside the battery. So that your electric vehicle will have the battery that you charge from the grid plus the energy that is developed by the small engine. Now the advantage of this is you don't need engine for propulsion. Okay. So till now we needed engine to go forward and because of this we were restricted to get, we were, you know, we needed some amount of power coming from the engine because you have to drive your vehicle, you have to start your vehicle from zero point, right, from zero speed. Now, in case of, uh, in this case, everything is done by the motor. The only reason why we have fitted a small engine is to provide that extra boost or extra mile, right? So that is why, that is how we can reduce the engine size to 10 to 20 percent, very little, right? And the fuel uh, in that will be very less. So this can be an advantage on your plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. In plug-in, we had 50-50, we had to fill in the fuel, we had to fill in the, uh, uh, the, we have to charge the battery as well. In this case, you would have to charge the battery and fill in very little fuel. And of course, we have the added advantage of very little emission. And that's what extended EV gives us, extended hybrid electric vehicle gives us. The best example of this is Chevrolet Volt. Now, going to the full electric vehicle, okay? So the basic difference in full electric vehicle from a hybrid vehicle is there is no engine. There is no engine at all. You have your battery, you have your motor, you have the controller, you have the converter, all the electronic systems will be there and there will be no engine, right? So till now what we had was, you know, the engines were reducing gradually. We came to a point where we only used 10 to 20% of power from the engine and rest of it from the battery. Now we are using 100% of the power from the battery, right? So. Basically, uh, propulsion is done by the battery, power is generated by the onboard battery, right? The only power source will be charged from the grid or solar or whatever it is, right? And then all the auxiliary system would work on 40 volt, 48 volt battery or 100 uh, volt battery with DC to DC converter. The best example of that is Tesla Model X, Indian model, Tata Nexon. Now, the only problem in this is, like uh, we talked about, you know, uh, when at a, you reach at a point where your battery is low, right? We talked about that, and we had solutions for that with with respect to you know gasoline fuel. But in this case, there is no engine. There is only one port for charging. There is no fuel tank. There is no fuel tank port. So how do we develop a technology that could cater to us in need of our like in, in need of you know emergency? If you are running low on battery, how could you you know recharge quickly? How could you move quickly, right? And the solution for that, till now what we have researched is swappable batteries, okay. So what they do is they uh, make the battery in a such a way, the model battery in a such a way that battery can be easily removed and easily assembled, okay. So if you see uh, there is a YouTube video uh, for Tesla Model S, what Elon Musk has done, uh, done is uh, they, have, uh, they have this setup for the battery swapping system. 
the Tesla Model S goes on that platform, it stands there, and by the time you fill up the fuel, like by the time you you know fill up the fuel tank to its fullest, right? In that time, the battery swapping system will swap the entire battery of the electric vehicle. Okay, so from zero charge, you go to hundred charge with, within seconds. Okay, and that was the advantage of swappable batteries, and that's how we are trying to solve the problem of you know running low on battery in full electric vehicle. Now. Uh, we have seen these changes happening in uh, India as well. You have uh, your, uh, you know, you've seen the cargo trucks, the cargo uh, vehicles which are electric, right? Uh, the small tempos and all those things. They now have swappable technology. They they can have uh, swappable batteries which can be removed by a human being. You can open simply open a door. You can pick up your battery, you can drop it, and you can change the battery at the station. The only problem is that is creating an infrastructure for, you know creating this swapping model. So if you if you think about it, in your college you can have a swappable station at the gate, right? There will be a swapping station where students can come or people can come, they can open the door, they can change the battery at the swapping station. The only problem is developing that infrastructure. And uh, in today's world, at least in India, as far as I'm familiar, there are multiple companies who are working towards the swappable technology. Right, so there's Sun Mobility, if you've heard of it, there's Sophie, there's SKS Tech, Clean Tech. These people are working to generate that you know, swappable infrastructure. And uh, like I said, it takes very little time to swap the batteries. And similarly, there's another solution for this. Uh, if you are familiar with this, there's a AAA service in US, majorly in US, right? So what they do is if, if your car breaks down, you simply give them a call, they will come to pick you up, they'll bring a towing van, they'll bring fuel with them, they'll bring, you know, extra batteries with them. And basically they'll help you run your vehicle from that point. Your, your vehicle was broken down, you, they'll help you run your vehicle from that. So similarly, the similar kind of services provided into EVs, what people are doing, they are creating onboard batteries onto cargo vehicles. Okay, so tempos like we have uh, 407 and all those uh, like big tempos, in that they store big batteries. Okay, batteries that can charge the onboard battery of the vehicle. Okay, so simply as you charge from the grid, you'll be charging from one vehicle to another vehicle. It's as simple as charging a charging from power bank. The only thing is, the users would have to initially invest in that, uh, you know, power bank. They'll have to take that service so that when the when the vehicle breaks down in the middle of the road, you simply give a call, they'll come and they'll charge your battery. For you. And that's how we're tackling the problem for, you know, battery running out in full electric vehicle. Now, this technology, right, shopping technology, and uh, you know, the charging technology to avoid or to solve the problems of uh, the uh, you know, battery running low. Once we solve that problem completely, then we can move on to fuel cell electric vehicle. Okay? So till now, whatever energies that we are generating, okay, and before I actually get into fuel cell, there's one thing we have, uh, we have yet, we are yet to understand how to generate electricity at a massive scale using renewable energy. Even today, 80 to 90 percent of the electricity is generated using coal. Okay, so we are not reducing our carbon footprint. We are not reducing our emissions by using EV today, right? Even if we use EV, you are going to charge from the grid, and the electricity on the grid is generated from the coal, right? So if you think about it, we are still using fossil fuel fuels. We are still, uh, you know, uh, releasing harmful emissions, harmful gases in the atmosphere, and we are still, uh, you know, harming the environment. But if we take this technology, the fuel cell technology will not be using hydrocarbon fuels or fossil fuels and will not be harming the environment. So before I get to this, I would like to bring up a point. So most of the time when I interact with students and most mostly happens with students, I don't know if they have very curious minds. But students always say so in today's world, how are we helping the environment or how are we helping the development of, you know, how are we getting rid of the fossil fuel even if, you, if I buy an EV today. So if I were to convince you to buy an electric vehicle, from an environmental standpoint, you can simply argue that even if I buy an electric vehicle today, all the energy is generated using coal. So it's not going to affect the environment, it's even going to harm it more because coal, uh, generating coal, electricity from coal is extremely inefficient, right? So you, you can argue with me that I'm still raising the you know emissions, I still have my huge carbon footprints. So how moving to EV helps, right? And after a long thought and after a long discussion with the students, after many, many long discussions with students, I have found that, you know, if we start using EV today, right, if we start using EV today, we'll be, uh, getting, we'll be getting used to it, 
right? And that's the important thing, right? Moving from gasoline to EV is very difficult as of, as of now. But moving from fossil fuels to renewable energy is extremely difficult when you compare it to, you know, moving from gasoline to electric vehicle. But if we take that initial step, if we go to electric vehicle, and still, which is still running on gasoline or fossil fuels or coal, whatever it is, right? But if we get to a point where we are using electric vehicle, now that electricity in the future could be from anywhere. Right? It can be from anywhere, from fossil fuels, from renewable energy, or for whatever it is, right? But if we stick to gasoline or if we stick to IC engine, it is always going to be internal combustion engine. It is always going to be fossil fuel, right? We are no, never going to switch to renewable energy because there is no internal combustion engine that works on renewable energy. And that is, you know, my counter argument to people who say that why buying EV today helps the environment. Because we are getting used to electric vehicles. The next generation of people will be used to electric vehicles and that electricity could come from the renewable energy. Now, coming back to the fuel cell electric vehicle, right? So, basically the working of fuel cell is, uh, from one end, there's a hydrogen, there are, there's a flow of hydrogen, so there's a fuel tank in which you fill up pure hydrogen. Uh, and then, that gas is passed through a, uh, the um, electrolysis chamber. And from the other end, the oxygen from the air is extracted and put into the chamber, into the electrolysis chamber. In presence of a catalyst, in presence of a catalyst, the hydrogen reacts with the oxygen and generates water. So the byproduct that comes out is water and the excess oxygen. So on the right side of the diagram, you can see oxygen comes in and water molecule and some of the oxygen leaves the vehicle. Right? So instead of getting your hydrocarbon, uh, exhaust gases from hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, you will be getting water and oxygen from the vehicle. On the other hand, you will see there is, uh, in, in, uh, while this is happening, while hydrogen and oxygen convert to water, during that, there are two free electrons generating every time this molecules, molecule takes place, right? every, time, every time this molecule is formed. So basically, uh, H2O, right? we have two hydrogen atoms and hydrogen has one free electron in each cell. So while this is happening, while the molecule is interacting with oxygen and you know converting itself into a water molecule, two free electrons from each atom are released into the circuit. And using those free electrons, we can either charge the battery, and if we get really good at it, we can drive our battery using this just like a gas Right? So currently we are at the charging stage where we charge the battery. Now, if you think about if we, if we go to the structure of it, right, it's going to have the uh, hydrogen fuel tank, right? So over here at the rear, you see the green part. I don't know if you are able to read it, but that's the hydrogen fuel tank. And then on the front, there's a fuel cell stack. So what we see on the left is one fuel cell, okay? One fuel cell, which is this small, okay? Like three, five mm, basically, five to 10 mm. And what we do is we create stacks of this. We create like, uh, like just like a motor, just like a battery, we create stacks of it. And using that, we charge up the battery. Now, once we get the battery charged, then we can use our terrestrial system to run the vehicle. Now, the only byproduct of this will be heat because, you know, there's a reaction, there's electrolysis, there will be some amount of heat and again, there will be heat from working of battery, working of motor. So, again, we need to add one system for, you know, thermal management or cooling and that's the only system we need to add into the uh, fuel cell electric vehicle. And uh, that's it for the fuel cell electric vehicle. We haven't made much development in fuel cell electric vehicle yet. So we don't have working models of fuel cell electric vehicle, but it's under development. And I hope to see uh, you know, good results in coming one or two years. So uh, that's it from my end. I'll quickly give you a review of what we have uh, you know, gone through today, what we've discussed today. First of all, we talked about electric vehicle architecture, where we described, where we distinguished the entire architecture into three things. First was electric propulsion, energy source, and auxiliary system. So, electric uh, in electric propulsion, we saw all the components that were necessary to, you know, take the vehicle forward from zero point. Then we talked about energy source. So, all the components that were required to, you know, store the energy, use the energy for propulsion comes under the energy source. Then there was the auxiliary system. In auxiliary system, we talked about all the electronics inside a vehicle, right? Which are also there in gasoline vehicle and which would have a higher development in electric vehicle. Then we went to types of EV in current market, right? Uh, the current market term is vaguely used here because the fuel cell is not yet in the market, but the rest of them are. So we talked about hybrid electric vehicle. We talked about three different types of hybrid electric vehicle, micro, mild, and full hybrid electric vehicle. Then we saw an additional change 
non hybrid electric vehicle with plug in hybrid electric vehicle right where we distributed the power 50 50 but we had a uh, pump for uh, i mean charging port for it then we talked about extended range ev which was the further development in the in the in the chain in the diagram where we reduced the uh, you know consumption of hydrocarbons we reduced the emission we reduced the use of engine and majority of the propulsion was taken place by the battery and the motor then we saw all electric vehicle where there was no engine uh, everything that was uh, all the propulsion was taken place by the battery by the motor and we saw what are the challenges in making all electric vehicle and how we can solve it and then we saw once we solve that pro those problems we can go to fuel cell electric vehicle so if there are any doubts if there are any questions i'd like to answer yes. thank you So what basically happens is the question is that uh, for our online listeners, the question is that what are the control techniques to increase the speed of the motor, right? So basically till now what we do is we have the DC current, right, which is constantly flowing at some frequency. What we do is initially we reduce the frequency of that current, okay? And when you press the accelerator, that frequency slowly increases. And with that increased frequency, since we have to take a VLDC motor, there will be six poles and each pole will be getting current at that frequency, right? Uh, they'll be getting the, you know, flow of positive and negative current at that pole with a particular frequency, like 60 hertz would give us like uh, 60 rotation or 60 cycles in one second. But if you increase the uh, frequency, if you go to 70 hertz, now the electricity is going faster, right? And the cycle is repeating itself faster and faster. And because of that, the motor itself rotates faster. And that's how, you know, we control the speed of the motor. This is the controller will be used, the inverter that we talked about. So if I go back to uh, the electric propulsion system, the inverter that we use, there's a controller, there's a box with electronics in it, right? Just to keep it simple, there's a box with electronics. What it does is, when you press the accelerator, it will take, uh, you know, new frequency or new requirement and according to that, adjust the frequency of the, uh, of the, of the motor, of the current supply to the motor. Sure. Okay, very good question, sir. So actually, when we talk about plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, what happens is if I could go back to that slide? Uh, yeah. So basically, what happens is either there are two things that we can do. Either we can give the power directly to the propeller shaft because that will in turn go to a differential and then the power will be distributed to the wheels. Another thing that we could do, which helps in the weight distribution as well, we can keep the electric drive on the left side of the vehicle and gasoline drive on the front side of the vehicle. And that actually helps in, you know, weight distribution of the vehicle. Individual transmission. Individual transmission for both of them. See, the thing is, uh, we can, as we reduce the size of technology, it's going to get expensive. That's the basic thing, right? Even if, even uh, if you talk about phones, right? Initially, we had that big phones, Nokia phones. Those were cheap. It was like 2,000, 3,000. Now, we are using 30,000 phones because it's all small and it's all really compact. But if you talk about uh, the, uh, you know, let's let's just go to the uh, actually extended range, even, right? Because the engine is very small in that. And it's basically an electric vehicle with the engine fitted into it. Now, if you think about it, it's not like the entire system is going to be one pack, right? If you think about it, it's an electric vehicle, and then you're putting in a small engine. So that small engine would cost you extra. So that's the that's the point. That's why it costs more in today's life. And like I said, uh, with development of more lithium ion, uh, you know, reservatives, and uh, with technologies of uh, involvement in batteries, we will get to a point where this will become very much affordable. Yes, sir. So, because uh, currently, if you think about it, the major development is taking place in hydrogen. And we, like I said, we expect hydrogen fuel cells to come in next two years. Correct. 
Correct, correct. So that's the that's the issues we are facing. And if you think about it, we have the same issues with the gasoline. So so the thing is definitely, definitely. But if you think about it, so you're talking about the challenges for hydrogen and you're saying that we would prefer ethanol over hydrogen, right? But if you think about it, if we think in that way, if we think about the challenges, right? Now imagine you're sitting inside a car or sitting on a bike, right? There is a small blast happening in your engine, right? Every th uh, every like 3000 times every minute, right? So if you think like that, it's going to be very difficult to, you know, go forward with technology. But we are seeing a lot of development in hydrogen and that is why we are moving forward hydrogen keeping the other things safely. Now the, adding to this point, right, uh, uh, there's one scientist Bill Nye, right, he's working uh, in, uh, uh, what is it called, Airbus, right, he's an engineer who's working in Airbus. Now what he says is, uh, what he says is, uh, people or uh, engineers are used to constraints, right, so if you give an engineer a task, this is the task, these are the constraints, he will be enjoy, he will enjoy to make that design, correct, so considering Hydrogen fuel cells, if it's giving the efficiency, if it's giving us the what we require, the constraints are add on for the engineer. He will take that constraint happily, he will include it in the safety system and then develop the hydrogen fuel cells. Yes, sir. Do you mean challenges of electric vehicle? If you mark something good, will it be effortless or will it be safety as in terms of Google? So, your phone charging is also hazardous if you think about it. Correct. 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 Sir, in that case, you answered your own question. If the parts are genuine, we'll be safe. Correct. Correct. So the thing is, um, when we go for electric vehicle manufacturing, right? There will be some standards for each of them. Okay. There will be IP ratings for waterproofing. There will be, uh, you know, con uh, the construction uh, ratings. The battery design itself takes a lot of you know, uh, uh, certifications, and then only it passes. So the safety point of it, there's not going to be much of an issue. Like if, if like I said, charging your phone is also a hazardous if you think about it, it could last at any time. But the thing is, we, we take, uh, we buy phones which have very good quality of product, right? And the, in the market, those products are, uh, are uh, running. Only those products will be running. Similar thing will be happening with EV. We'll have standard products, we'll have good products that will be running. Hope most of the questions are answered and the rest of the questions will be answered in the next session. Uh, we'll break for a tea now and then join in 10 minutes back. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Arbaz. We'll, we'll be ready in another 15 minutes for the next session. Thank you. I request everybody to kindly join for the tea break. Uh, for the online viewers, uh, we'll be uh, resuming in another 15 minutes time. Please bear with us. Thank you. The site will be on, but uh, we'll resume only after 15 minutes. Thank you.
I don't know, I'm not sure. The only problem with the phone is uh, battery. Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, we have to keep on passing it and make some of it. Yeah. 
ಹೋಗುತ್ತೆ ನಾಕು ಅದ್ರ ನೂರಕ್ಕೆ ಮೂರ ನೋಡಪ್ಪ ಏನಾದ್ರೂ ರೆಸ್ಟ್ರಿಕ್ಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರೆ ಏನೇನು ಇಟ್ಕೊಳ್ಳೋದು ಎಚ್ ಡಿ ಎಮ್ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಐ ಡೆಫಿನೇಷನ್ ಮೈಕ್ರೋ ಇಂಟಿಗ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮೈಕ್ರೋ ಇಂಟಿಗ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮೈಕ್ರೋ ಅದು ಫೋರ್ಡ್ ಇದಿಲ್ಲ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಯು ಎಸ್ ಬಿ ಇರ್ತಾವಲ್ಲ ಫೋರ್ಟ್ ಅದು ಎಮ್ ಐ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಸಂಬಂಧ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇವರು ದುಡ್ಡು ಕೊಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ರು ಸರ್ಟಿಫಿಕೇಟ್ ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ದುಡ್ಡು ಕೊಡ್ತಾರೆ ಸರ್ ಬನ್ನಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಮುಗಿಸ್ಬಿಡೋಣ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡೋಣ ಸರ್ ಬನ್ನಿ ಬೇಗ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಮುಗಿಸ್ಬೇಕು
ಒಂದು ವರ್ಷ ಇದೆ ಮೂವೆರಡು ವರ್ಷ ಏನು ಮಾಡಿ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ಈ ಸರ್ ಆಫ್ಲೈನ್ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಪ್ರಿಫರ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ದೆ ಒಂದು ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದೆ ಒಳ್ಳೆ ಆಫ್ಲೈನ್ ಅಂತ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡಿದ್ದ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಆಗೋಯ್ತು ಪ್ರಾಬ್ಲಮ್ ಆಗಿ ಕ್ಯಾಂಪಸ್ಸಲ್ಲಿ ಅವ್ರ ಕೋವಿಡ್ ಕೇಸ್ ಕಾಲೇಜಲ್ಲಿ ಕಾನ್ಫರೆನ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ದೆ ಆಫ್ಲೈನ್ ಎಲ್ಲ ರಿಜಿಸ್ಟ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ರು ಆಫ್ಲೈನ್ ಮತ್ತು ಕೋವಿಡ್ ಕೇಸ್ಗಳು ಕ್ಯಾಂಪಸಲ್ಲಿ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಆಗಿದ್ದಕ್ಕೆ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಪರ್ಮಿಷನ್ ಕೊಡಲಿಲ್ಲ ಆಫ್ಲೈನ್ ಅವಾಗ ಆನ್ಲೈನ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಮುಗಿಸ್ತಿದ್ದೆ ಅವ್ರೇನು ಹೇಳಿಲ್ಲ ನೋಡಿ ಬೋದ್ ದೇವಿಲ್ಲ ಏನು ಬರ್ದಿಲ್ಲ ಹ್ಞೂ ಪಿಕ್ ಆಗ್ಬೇಕಾ ಎ ಬಿ ಸಿಗೆ ಸಿ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎ ಬರಿಬೇಕಾ ಅಂತ ಪಿಕ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಹಂಗೆ ಹಾಕಿ ಸಿಗ್ನೇಚರ್ ಅಂತಂದರೆ ಸಿಗ್ನೇಚರ್ ಅಂದರೆ ಕರೆಕ್ಟ್ ಆಗಿರ್ಬೇಕ ಎಲ್ಲರ ಹತ್ರ ಮತ್ತೆ ಎಲ್ಲೇ ಬರ್ದೇ ಪಿಕ್ ಆದ್ರೆ ಈಸಿ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಕೋರ್ಡಿನೇಟರ್ ಅಟ್ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಕೋರ್ಡಿನೇಟರ್ ಅಟೆಂಡೆನ್ಸ್ ಸಿಗ್ನೇಚರ್ ಪಿಕ್ಕ ಬರ್ದೇ ಗಿರೀಶ ಏನ್ ಗಿರೀಶ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಇರ್ಲಿಲ್ಲ ಅಡ್ರೆಸ್ ಇರ್ಲಿಲ್ಲ ಬಟ್ ಸಿಗ್ನೇಚರ್ ಏನೇನು ಬರೀತಾರ ಮತ್ತೆ ಮಧ್ಯಾಹ್ನ ಕ್ಲಾಸ್ ಇದೆ ಮೊಬೈಲ್ ಆಡೋಣ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ಲೈಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೇವೆ
that has struck with the member of the community. Now, uh, because there are many times when the engine itself is used as a structural member, it's not in four wheelers, mostly in two wheelers this is used. But yes, it, it's not a new when you compare it to that. But yes, uh, you know, the first time it's going to happen when a battery or an actual uh, power rate component is being used as a structural member. Then after that, we talk about load management and CG placement. So, CG is the center of gravity of a vehicle. And how are you going to manage the loads? So, basically, where do you place the battery? Since it is one of the most dangerous part, second, qualifying the motor in the vehicle. And that is apart from the entire volume in the vehicle, right? So, where do you place this entire weight? is going to play a very, very big part of how a vehicle is going to be made. And we will come to that in detail later. Then, braking, of course. Uh, and I don't remember a uh, really famous Formula 1 uh, driver once said. Uh, I, I don't remember his name though. I, or this line always sticks with you. You can only go as fast as you can break. So if you have a vehicle that can go up to 300 km per hour, but it only has the capacity to stop for a vehicle, like your vehicle system is designed for something like 100 km per hour. At the minimum, least distance, you would not have the courage to go to the other because you know if something goes wrong, you must stop. So that's where braking is the most important part in any vehicle. Uh, I, I like to tinker with vehicles myself. I get a new bike or something. I, I like to modify it. I know it is not right according to the law, but yes, I, I enjoy modifying the vehicle. And believe it or not, the first component that I would, uh, I have friends also who write. The first component that uh, they would modify after getting a new bike or new car would be the exhaust. Why? Because people think that, you know, as, as you know, the magnetic and the exhaust system, it is much more powerful than the electric car. And the vehicle sounds also. The first thing that I would upgrade could be slightly more expensive than an exhaust upgrade would be the vehicle. Because you know that whatever the manufacturer has rated the vehicle, it will go more than that. Whatever the top speed is given, it will always go more than that. But can it stop more than that? That is one thing. So I, I put a lot of emphasis into braking in the year 2020. Next, we we'll talk about cornering effect and stability. Now, this is very important when you consider that vehicles are not going to run, run in a straight line. The only vehicles that run in a straight line are tracksters or vehicles prepared for drag racing, and that they are only meant to go in a straight line. You cannot run them no matter what you do. Shower and elephant in their way also, this thing is not going to run. It will keep going straight. Real world vehicles which actually ferry people from point A to point B need to take turns at a very reasonable pace without losing control and you know, without destabilizing themselves. Then the last one is noise and vibrations. I am not going to explain it now. We will talk about it again. Okay. So, first we talk about structural member. So, battery itself is a rigid member. Uh, so, basically, what happens is if you look at you know, the two examples out here. I don't know how clear the image is, but this is a ladder frame chassis. A uh, standard ladder frame chassis that is used in most of our vehicles. Uh, nowadays, not so much. Nowadays, we have heard from the number of questions. But in the past, we used a lot of ladder frame based things. And uh, today also, if you're looking at vehicles like say 407 models, the Tata Zenon, um, the Tata Hagar, uh, the Thar, all of these vehicles that are made for a bit of off roading and all, always will use something like a ladder frame chassis. Now, here we have a similar system, but this is for an electric vehicle. So, what's the major difference that you see? There, these, all of these components right up here. In the center of this, they are the structural members. They are there to provide rigidity. So that when you take this vehicle, when you are turning with it, it's going to be a lot of, like when you are turning with it, it's going to be a lot of twisting forces acting on the chassis. They are there to prevent the chassis from taking a permanent bend. If you are going to take your vehicle off road, there will be a bit of twisting force. So that, they are of course there to prevent it, and they are necessary. But if we say they are necessary, they also come with an added amount of weight. And that is with the actually solid wheels. You, you cannot do any kind of weight reduction on them. Small bit of parts here and there, okay, you, you have the rest of the time in here, you did a lot of analysis. You yeah, you managed to reduce weight, but how much? 30% max. 
Think about knowing all the other So the battery over there. Now the battery by default needs all of that. Whatever arrangement is there or its structural utility, it needs it. So if you are going to have structural members and a battery on top of it, doesn't make sense. You remove the structural member, just put your battery over there, and the battery is now doing the work of the structural member. So that's how you reduce the weight of the vehicle. Next is since we transferred the battery down and we are going to consider a dynamic drive vehicle, which uh, like I argue, you know, is not the best type when it comes to uh, this, uh, uh, which should I say, making economical vehicles. But here we are talking about an EV. We can give the power to whichever vehicle we want. We are not restricted by something like a differential. If you are going to put something like a direct drive, it's not necessarily you need to have one motor, you can have four motors in your car. Each car will be one wheel each, and have an all wheel driving wheel. You could have two motors standing part of the driving wheel. It, it's your choice because it's compact. The system itself is so compact. But when you are talking about engines, uh, let's just talk about performance only. If you are going to talk somewhere around uh, six inline six cylinders, maybe V10s, V8s, massive engines. You can't have two of those, you need to have one of them. The only instance where, say, a V8 became, uh, was connected was when the Bugatti went on, where there was a W16 engine, two V8 engines were connected, and that is a hypercar, it's not even a supercar. And the price also, of course, is that high. So, then we should, you know, uh, we remove the engine from the building. What I want to do is so much of empty space now. You could either make it a storage space or this is the travel zone of the vehicle. Now, why does this travel zone exist? Basically, you can see in this GM that I have added, this empty space in the front and at the back of the engine. So, when your car collides, it takes in some amount of your car. But we cannot deny the fact that in an IC engine, if your engine is placed in the front, it could be an FF configuration, which is a front engine, front wheel drive configuration, or it could be an FR configuration, front engine, the rear wheel drive configuration, your engine will be in the front. When your car collides with something head on, as much as possible, the body is going to take the energy, it will deflate, it will deform. But when it hits the engine, the engine is a solid member. If too much of energy is delivered onto the engine, it will tear its mouth and it will try to enter into the passenger compartment, which has happened in many uh, cases. You know, it has hit the firewall and entered into the passenger compartment. So when you are talking about even this front part is completely empty, it can be deformed without any problem. So you can add a lot of structural rigidity to the front of the vehicle, so that in your car can take a full head-on impact. It can take a side impact. So when you are talking about impact testing, these are very important things. So your E is going to be uh, rated for a much, much, much higher safety rating, I would say, in, in the sense of work. Pfizer is by default, after so much amount of energy absorbed, Pfizer will be by default. So, yes, this is another advantage. Now, yeah, so I have explained most of it, but uh, again, in a pictorial representation, you see your impact is coming from the front, your VIW, the body in white of the front, it is designed in such a way where it absorbs most of the energy and sends it to the sides towards the figure. As you can see, Everything is going towards the pillars. Nothing is penetrating into the cabin, and that is very, very important when you are talking about passenger safety. Because you want to keep the energy released away from the passengers. Because if it is directed towards the passengers, of course, you will have a lot of tension. So, that is where we talk about structural development. Now, second, let's talk about load management and CG management. Okay. So, but one simple thing, the GR that I want to show you, this is called as a motion, it is not among the vehicles over here in India, but it is a very, very, very common test done on vehicles uh, in the US, in the UK. Wherever there is, uh, so I think India we have uh, in major cities, at least we are encouraged into the animal plant and, you know, shoot the animals away. But over there we have animals like a moose, it, it, uh, like a yak, it's a really huge animal and very ferocious in nature, it will attack anything that moves if it's animal. So this, they have this animal common to the roads. Over there, a person cannot crash into this 
and uh, because the animal itself weighs somewhere around 450 kilos with huge animal rescue. If a person crashes, he'll of course damage or hurt the animal really badly, but also will damage his own vehicle and himself if anything were to go wrong. So he took the reality. Now, in the most case, what one of the most important things is how the vehicle is designed and where its center of gravity lies. Now, for this, we have taken the Jeep Compass, it is one of the better performing SUVs when you use it in the most case. When you are talking about a vehicle, uh, I don't want to inflate any other companies or about the name, but there are many other SUVs that look so menacing, look like, you know, they, they look scary. But when you are subjected to the most test, you have the lift, the rear wheel, you have the spin out of control and things like that. So whenever the center of gravity is lower, when the weight of the vehicle is lower, now since we are not talking about weight, we are only talking about center of gravity on the other. This is one of the tests that will heavily affect a uh, gasoline engine versus an EV. Because you have uniform load placed on the underbody of your vehicle, thus making the vehicle much more stable. So uh, that is one. And okay. So now this is a uh, Subaru when it launched its boxer engine. So and most of you will know what boxer engines are. If someone doesn't, uh, what a boxer engine is, is you have your uh, inline engine, they fire in one direction. You have your V-shaped engine, they fire in two different directions like this. It could be L and different conversation. A boxer are exact opposite 180 degree firing. So you have two pistols here and two pistols firing in the opposite direction. Either they could be firing in the same or the opposite direction. So what the biggest advantage is, and BMW was the first company and is yet using boxer engines today in the uh, adventure series mode settings. So boxer engine, what it does is it, is, it was designed to in fact lower the center of gravity. When the Porsche 911 Servo, the widow maker, people named it because the car was so powerful and scary to control. It actually did a lot of widow, so people nicknamed it as the widow maker. That car came with a boxer engine. So, when Subaru was the boxer engine, the easiest way for it to advertise it was this is your convention inline engine. The center of gravity is much higher. Boxer engine is low. Car is much more stable. No matter, you know, you're subjecting it to forces. There will be some amount of body work, not as much as compared to an inline engine. Now imagine this, a boxer engine is yet sitting up above the tires, above the suspension. Get it to the level of the tires and suspension, even lower. Of course, body work is going to be mitigated. If you look at Formula cars, Formula 1 cars, forget Formula 1 cars, we talk about student Formula cars, they are very an inch of the ground. Why? Because the lower the center of gravity, the more stable the Okay, so yeah, this is just a representation of the new engine. Now, let's talk about it. Okay. So, uh, when you get break, there's a lot of energy wasted, right? For example, uh, you spent a lot of fuel, got up to 60 km per hour, someone on the highway cuts you off. Now you want to drive slow. Wasted their energy to go to 60 km per hour, that guy is driving at 40, you have to break this body. The energy, the 20 km per hour extra that you put in, that's wasted. How is it wasted? In heat. Brake pipes caught onto the rotors, heat was generated and dissipated. Gone, that energy is completely gone. In an electric vehicle, what we can do is something called as a regenerative braking system. Right? What is a regenerative braking system? Simple. You gave energy to the wheels, you generated momentum, you have a lot of inertia. Now you decide, I need to brake. I start pressing the brake button. Now the car is smart enough to determine. You press the pedal and you are going to be That is, you can see that there is a signal up ahead at quite a distance. You want to do it slowly. Rather than engaging your motors, what this will do is it will directly engage. Your motor generator unit or the motor will work as a generator unit at that point and start providing resistance to the wheel. And that's what braking is, right? Resisting the rotation of the wheel. You start providing resistance. But here, when you provide resistance, that energy generated is going to charge your battery. Which is much more efficient, which is much, much more sensible. So, yeah, uh, one more So, an EV will be equipped with a proper braking system. ABS, EBD, all the shenanigans, 
everything is going to be there in the because when you snap onto the thing, but then I will decide that, oh damn, I have to stop, otherwise it's going to be crashed. That's when it will engage the entire way. So you will not care about energy then. That's when your life is important and success is important. And it will deploy your entire waking force onto all of its wheels and properly get your car towards stop. So the intervention is not going to be used anywhere. But it is one of the bigger factors which helps you increase your range. The overall range you should drive without regenerative braking. You are looking at say 100 km per hour with regenerative braking, you are looking at somewhere around 120, 120. So that's like a 30% increase that you get in the overall efficiency of your vehicle minimum. So this is the Nissan Leaf. So as you can see, the accelerator is 100%, it is going to be in the drive mode. When the brake of the person is right mode, then the accelerator is at 100%. Okay? This bar determines the amount of pressure that you are putting. And uh, yeah, so when it switches to brake, your front wheels are uh, connected to the motor and you are providing the required resistance and charging the battery. This is also used in a couple of cars that we see today in the Indian market and that would be the Maruti Suzuki line of cars. So this is that we Everything that comes with part either. Maruti values this technology so much, it literally gave one of, uh, two of its top performers to the uh, to get the deal, like Avis Balino and Avis just for this technology. Because Toyota had perfected it. And Toyota had the best interest in this. The biggest, the camera, things like that. So the mind behind the technology was that important. And this we are talking about when, who five years, more than five years ago. That's when this technology actually came in. And it uses very similar technology as the generative making to serve the need. So, yes. So, what are the effects? Let's watch the GR. It's a game, buddy. So, basically, your heavy driving right? If it's going to be heavy, it's going to, uh, you know, if you're going to take a turn with it, it has a tendency to understand. What to understand is, you want to go here, your car is taking you here. Simple. Simple terms. Why does this happen? Either your vehicle is not designed properly, either the suspension is not set up properly, or the weight of the vehicle is too much. So, how does you know uh, how 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 does EV change? Oh, one more important thing: center of gravity. How that is affected is it prevents the body load of the vehicle to that amount of weight. So, when you're taking a turn, you have that vehicle goes acting on your vehicle, right? For example, the upper body is pushed out. If uh, anyone over here has uh, traveled by a bus or something like that. And the bus has suddenly taken a quick turn. You will notice, since you are so much higher on the ground, your legs move with the bus, the upper body did not. And that is what's going to happen. So, again, your airways and vehicles have a huge tendency to understand. So, to prevent that, if you look at the center of gravity, what happens is the vehicles are much more stable, under cornering, you have very little body load, and less of body load means more traction means, of course, much, much more control on the uh, right, right? Next one is noise and vibration. So, yeah. Now, EVs don't have, generally don't make a sound. You generally get the sound of the motor pulling up to certain degree. That's it. Uh, one of the first cars to give the feeling is the BMW ID. This car is owned by Sachin. So, what did this car do so differently? It is called itself a sports car with a three cylinder engine. Possible. The other thing that is possible. They made it into a hybrid vehicle. You need to connect the power socket to it, of course, and you need to fuel it. This car has a three cylinder engine which kicks in with the power. So, when you have to get off the line, you don't have to electric power. It provides you a certain speed. That's when the engine comes in. Takes over. It doesn't take over 100% or so, to a certain degree. And to give the person driving the vehicle the feel, what we have computed was that it speakers on the inside. So you can make a BMW i8 sound like a V12. You want it to sound like a V12. Okay. Can be made possible. You want it to sound like a turbocharged V8. Possible. Everything can be done. It is 
audio, right? Programmable audio. Impossible. So this is very, very, very important when you talk about the people who are seasoned drivers. Now everyone sitting in the room, if you drive for this, right? And if you have a passion for your car, you will everything that your vehicle communicates with you. Car or bike, something like that. Your vehicle will communicate with you. What is it that is actually communicating with you? It is the process. On the motorcycle, the right hand, on the car, your right foot. Every time you press the throttle, you hear the car roar, you hear the machine roar, then it starts catching speed. So you know, you know at what state is your vehicle running. And that's like, you know, so if you have written an electric vehicle with no sound, you will miss character, there is zero character that you will feel. How do you get that character? Because it is very, very important for people to have that connection because over the years we have all learned that the more sound the engine is making, the louder it starts getting, the higher the altitude is running. How do you understand whether your motor is running at 90% uh, or your motor is running at 10%? It's not going to make the same sound. That's why we need to add adaptation. Apart from that, uh, my dad had the same problems, okay? So, uh, and he considered a modern day car a driver. So, he's very accidents have increased because the cars have got quieter. So, I was like, how? So, he's like, uh, look at Premier Padmini, look at Impala, they were loud guys. The moment it would enter a lane, people would leave because they could hear the engine rumble. In today's modern day petrol cars, the car will go silently and ask someone else you want them to do. Which was true. You can leave your car on a touch and you can make fun sound. However, if you hit the throttle, it will make some sound. He is not going to do that. Hence, external speakers needed to be added to make the car sound. Sounds were very important for pedestrians to understand that there is an approaching vehicle. Sounds were very important. To ensure that uh, you know the driver ahead of you can hear you to a certain degree and understand there's a vehicle. The tire screeching sounds, your, your tire also makes a certain amount of sound, your engine makes a certain amount of sound. So all that is necessary to be kept into the vehicle. So that's why Tesla has added external speakers. So there is one app on Tesla. After this meeting, whoever is watching, you can go on the YouTube. And put a Tesla speaker app. It, it's a really funny video. So, the people who message the Android phones, uh, so you know, you go into the about phone and then go into the software and the money tap it and then you can get a, uh, a mini game which is for the other version of the So, we know that it does something like that. And uh, after doing that, what you can do is put whatever sounds you want. So, your horn can be a touch speaking, uh, your acceleration could be a jet flight whatever you want. So that is possible. You could have the best pop song played while you are driving. It's not wrong. Let's start with it just as a way of fun. Apart from that, it's also added uh, vertical connection. So you can have 10 Tesla cars playing the same song at the same time. And things like that. So yes, sounds are also very important. Uh, Tesla you know, must have the habit of being a bit goofy. He's one of the smartest minds of the current century, but he has the habit of being a bit goofy. So, like what we can take out of it is, sounds are super important. That's my time. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes. Minimum amount of noise is required so that people around it are aware as well as the Apart from that, in any other place. Yeah. No, they will be required even after that. Those are things. It is uh, automatic feedback is uh, you know uh, I'm not using the right term medically, but yes, we will need to listen to stuff to the because we are we are lacking vibration. Now we don't have vibration. The only thing that is a sound. Yeah, because uh, they near future they are saying that not vibrating. True. Rolls Royce has come up with the concept for that. Yes. Sir. No, lithium ion batteries are very, very, very expensive. Uh, I guess, sir, you had asked about pricing, right? Why the vehicle is expensive? Uh, lithium ion, first thing, sourcing the battery, very difficult. Not everyone will do it. Maintenance of the battery, not everyone will do it. Today, 
you will find living in Bangalore, it's easy for you. You go to Mumbai, it will be easier for you. You go to Delhi, it will be easier. You go to a place uh, where there's not much development, where there's not many of you want manufacturing in these batteries. You buy an electric vehicle, very happy. You charge it, everything looks like right. Now the battery pops up. You need to maintain it. I'm not talking about even replacing it, I'm only talking about maintaining it. You need minimum 25 to 48 hours for this battery to be removed from your vehicle. You cannot drive your car. It will be removed, it will be taken, maintained, and then fitted. So, because the locations are not that much, and I personally did not know about this, this is a real world problem. I came to know about it when I was speaking to an expert in the industry who has recently started to know about this company. So, I was like, there are bigger players, no, why, why, why you want to try to invest in it? And bigger players, but they are in different parts. I started my company in UP, he is from the airport, right? he started his company in UP. Why did he start it in UP? He is the sole guy who is selling batteries to them now. No one else tells you about it. Simple. So, for your question, sir, uh, these batteries won't get spoiled quite easily, provided there is regular maintenance. But currently, we do not have the infrastructure for this kind of thing. It is building at a very, very rapid pace. Today, people who have worked in the industry for the past 10 years, 12 years, who have this kind of experience are jumping into the field into business just for the battery. Because until and unless there are local manufacturers of batteries, even the best of the best companies, you want to talk about Tata, you want to talk about Mahindra, they will not be able to provide customer support in a particular area until and unless there are local vendors for their batteries. And till they set up a plant for that, it takes very long. So, yes. Of course. So, in your car, when you saw this, Engine is just one part of it, right? You have to get your brake pads checked. You have to check with whether your suspension is in tune. You have to check your fuel alignment. You have to check your balance. Those are just a couple of things. So, it's a bad. It's a bad thing. Yes. So, it's a bad thing. Yeah. Not exactly. Lithium ion does not require that much amount of maintenance, and that is one of the reasons that it has been chosen. For uh, rather than a lead acid, there is no leakage or any such kind of issue. Hence, lithium ion has been chosen for this particular application and everyone is using it widely. So, maintenance will be required over a longer period of time, not as frequently as you would for a engine because there are no moving parts of it. And if you put the normal electric pump, uh, it totally depends on the and to start the night, how much electricity charge extra will come? I really cannot answer that because it is too young. So, yeah, it depends, it depends from manufacturer to manufacturer. So, now Ava is providing you with subscription. You buy a subscription, charge at our outlets a million times. No issue. Pay the subscription. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I cannot talk about that. I do not have a on that. If you are going to ask me to replace completely, we are not there. But if you are going to ask me, I rather go home to office every day. And I want to explore the outskirts of that. The easy one to be a better option. If you're going to tell me I want to do interstate travel, that's not a better option. It can do it, but it's not the best option. Why? Because you don't have the infrastructure. And above those talking about swappable value. When that technology comes in, yes, then interstate would be possible. And according to the standardization, is one of very key factors which major players need to come in, sit around the table and standardize the value. If you understand that the batteries are standardized, we cannot have the same thing to stop. And this is the value that you are driving on a highway, you see Tata Mahindra, Tata Mahindra, Tata Mahindra, Tata Mahindra, then when you will like on this, then when Kia comes in, and things like that. It won't work like that, right? We have a single, say, two, three companies, petrol, VHL, HP, and one petrol. You will see these two stations, 100, uh, and, uh, like 50 kilometers apart on the highways. 
Something similar to that. Once you have a sanitized bucket set, which you remove and you uh, put it back in, then you don't need So, yes, we, we are not there yet. We, we should get there. Then replacing completely won't be possible at this point. Yes. So, one more thing, uh, Tesla is leaving the driver is not. Is it true? Yes, we did make it. We did face a couple of problems. Yes, for India, it is even. We are not good enough, sir, for Indian roads. No, no, even we are not doing that here. We also end up by having accidents. So, yes, um, for a robot to work, what do you need? Repetition. You write, sir? You write, right? I'm not free. No, no, you write anything. So, you tell me one thing. When you leave from home to you come here, for example, how many types of repetitions happen? Yeah, I'm going to have to repetition that 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 i am Tesla is started, sir. And again? Tesla is started in India. Uh, I'm not sure, sir. I, I read about it. They ran a couple of problems. So, please, please, please. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. I think I'm going to question. So, uh, so, now for the certification, uh, there will be a QR code. There's a hand, people want. And please, with the comment, very quick. Any other questions, I'll do it. No constraints. So 
Depends on battery voltage, volt, no? Okay. Okay. And that one is the 
గేమ్ నేను బుధవారం తెలియాలి అన్న వాళ్ళ అత్ర ఒక కన్ఫ్యూజ్ అవుతా జయశీల్ సార్ ఆన్లైన్ ఏమైనా క్యూఆర్ స్టోర్ కన్సల అయితే